Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my 153rd episode of the BCMO Tech Tuesday. Sorry about me being slightly tardy. As a matter of fact, I was getting really excited with the guys back there. Testing this new 2020 Civic Si, doing some experimentation, as I tend to love to do all the time. So good afternoon, everyone. Today, something I wanted to do with all of you is share some really cool information. My experiences, technology, what we're playing with back there, with the SI, the SoCal, Electrified SoCal Initiative, which has happened recently as well, which is great. Um, so let's talk about that first. And then I'll get to your BMW question, Matamu, Matamu. So, Electrified SoCal, what is it exactly? Well, it's interesting because uh, there are local initiatives in the Southern California area in excess of $430 million that have been released to put in charging stations all around Southern California. And this is great because you can put it in businesses, apartment complexes, and so on and so forth. And sometimes with little investment or no investment from the landowners. So it's cool because as California becomes more and more, uh, how should I say, commuter friendly, it's good to have charging stations to allow that to happen in business complexes, apartment buildings, so on and so forth. Now, if you guys are interested in having someone do that, if you have a, a, a land or you're a business owner or, a, or, or you're a landlord for someone, or you have influence or something in your business where you want one installed, feel free to go to this website. It's very, very simple. I had it written down somewhere here. It is the blinkcharging.com backslash, all in one word, Electrify SoCal. Or, if you want, why don't you go ahead and send me a DM and I'll set it up for you as well. Either way. But it's a great initiative where we can have chargers level 2, Chatamo, CCS. We can have all these great charging systems all around Southern California, which is great. And with little or no expense from the landowner. So, let me know. Great initiative. Thank you, Blink Charging, for actually taking a spearhead on this. Blink Charging is one of our technical partners and they are amazing when it comes to infrastructure that has to do a lot with charging stations and safety charging devices, which I love so much. Even the ones for the home. I think we have the HQ series on Amazon that's about $400 or so, which you can get 30% off still if you use this code of BCMoto30, all one word. So that being said, um, that can totally happen and I love their stuff. It doesn't look like a, a nasty refrigerator. It's actually a very beautiful black device and very elegant looking and, and increases property value in your home as well, which is good. Big Car Guy says, Cootie, dope. It's not the word for what you do. Really cool. Thank you so much. And speaking of dope, look behind me. See uh, some of my friends back there putting on a blow valve test? So there's this crazy test that I thought was a joke. But I guess it wasn't a joke. And, and I said, you know what? It's a myth about blow valves and tension civics. So I'm going to do a test here in the house. We already did something very clever when it comes to being able to get a baseline first. Then we're going to switch over, and I'm using my dyno to monitor all OBD parameters. And then I'm going to set up on a stock setup as it is now. American Honda, thank you so much for providing this car to us to do this amazing myth bust. So above and beyond that, no matter what the data I get, I'm going to put more boost courtesy of a K-Tuner. So I have K-Tuner software. Thank you, K-Tuner, for providing that license. We're going to raise the boost level and do the test again and see what happens. And I'm going to monitor, in particular, the wastegate duty, because the wastegate is what really does a great job in being able to determine and manage boost levels. And there's a silly rumor where there's another parameter involved, which we'll find out in a moment if that's true or not. I really think it's not. It doesn't make any logical sense. But we're going to get that going, which is great, you know? There it is. So Blink Charging just put it up. BlinkCharging.com, Electrify SoCal, to get more information on how, whether it's apartment complex, businesses, we already have our complex set up to make sure that it happens here. And it's great because you can attract, in a, in a business complex, you can attract better tenants and retain tenants. It's great for employees and people who work there and even, even business owners to be able to have a place to charge. In apartment complexes, it can allow you to attract even more rent and even retain good tenants. It's a win-win. And like I said, once again, it's, many times it's little or almost no expense on the part of the landowners, which is great. Ari Nathaniel is asking, how can I learn to tune an ECU? Well, it's very, very easy. There are so many great classes out there. There's the HPA, Horsepower Academy. There's a, the guys from Ankla who are doing also some good stuff in terms of, how should I say, uh, training. There's EFI 101. Those are good ways that you can learn from a reputable source how to tune. Then the next step is to get a vehicle that's very tuner friendly, get some software and play around with your vehicle yourself. Not with clients' cars, but your own car, you know? Tundra says, I love listening and learning from you, BC. Class act, thank you, my pleasure indeed. I'm just trying to be that person that I needed when I was younger. Because when I came to the United States, people just didn't want to help me, even though I knew a lot about I want to learn a lot about vehicles, about what was going on with my vehicle, you know? So that being said, 
not having that influence is just only John Conciati from AEM who really took me under his wing. But it took me a long time to find him. A lot of people did not um, really want to help at all. It was just sad, you know? And then guess what? Now that I've accomplished quite a bit in the United States and I want to give back, I want to be that person for all of you that I needed when I was younger. And I, I'm just sharing everything I know, literally everything, guys. Knowing that technology continues to push forward and continues to evolve, and what I know today, I didn't know last week, and next month, I'll know more than I even know right now. It's a continuous learning process. So I have no problem sharing that with you. Emergency Hooker, it's good seeing you, brother. I love you. Where's my hug? <laughs> good seeing you. Hello, Ram Wookie 84 Thank you so much. Um, no computer mic. I don't think the video stopped. Let me know if you guys are having a hard time seeing or hearing from me. Please let me know. Indeed. So, back here, Honda is at it again. They have this SI, which is like a performance version of the Civic line. Um, not quite as crazy as a Type R, not as lowly as a Sport, but right in the middle, like a sweet spot. And they're, they sell more of these almost 10 times they sell Type R's, which is great. And it's really, right now, it's a petrol vehicle, um, not an EV, real Miguel, and has a small 1.5 liter engine, turbocharged. Really, lu really luxurious for an SI. It's so amazing how they, they've come such a long way with the Civic brand. It's just very nice. It has all these great safety features and lane warning assist and all that crazy nuts. It's pretty good. But what's interesting is it's supposed to make anywhere from 208, 205 to 208 horsepower. Just a baseline, it did 190 to the wheels. Baseline. Crazy, right? It's like crazy power with over 217 pound foot of torque. So this thing is, Honda's underrating, which most manufacturers are doing now, and I can't wait to do a little bit more and see what we can get out of this, which is great, you know? Pinch KNG says, do you modify every Porsche you own? I do actually, from the 991 all the way to the 67 912. Everyone is, mo is, is modified. Now the least heavily modified I would say would be the slat nose, that just has an exhaust pulse chamber system on it. But the most advanced, most craziest, I guess, would be the 75 uh, 930. That right there has a water-cooled engine and twin turbos. Oh, I guess, it's a, I guess it's a mix between the 930 and the K3V. I guess they're both heavily modified, you know, which is great, you know? Um, how's the minifan doing? It's just sitting right there. We drove it last week. It's just sitting there collecting dust in the corner. Um, behind me here, I'll try to switch, forgive me you guys on YouTube, but I'll try and switch you guys over here. But behind me there's a, like a, a Mark III Super right here and a Cayman up there and a 99 1.2 right there, you know. So, yeah. Uh, so, dealing at design has a good question. He's asking uh, a good question, a question that comes quite often. Could you explain how that pulse chamber works? Um, tell you what, give me a second, let me grab a prototype. The very first one I made is really crude, and I'll, I'll show you something. Just give me a quick second, guys, okay? This is the very first Type R, no, not Type R, <laughs> pulse chamber ever made. I said Type R because I saw uh, Charles Hearn from Dream Automotive. Please tell Phil I said hi. I think you guys are all the way in the UK, which is great. So this right here, see how dirty it is? Because we put this through a proper test. Proper test. So to answer the question how the pulse chamber works, it's very simple. See this tube right here? That right there? That is a Helmholtz tube. Now, air is a fluid. And just the same way water in a pond is a fluid, air has very similar properties. Similar, not exact, but similar. So when you drop a pebble at the edge of a lake and you see the wave travel on that lake and get to the end of the lake, if it's a small lake, and come back, reflect back, the same thing happens with sound and air and all that good stuff. And air doesn't has mass, but not as much as you would see with a fluid like water, but same thing happens. So here's what happens. When a sound wave travels down, or pulse wave travels down this exhaust system, it gets to the end of this pipe and reflects back. If you time that reflection back based upon the length of this tube, you can cancel a certain unwanted frequency. So, what's very commonplace on Porsches, flat sixes, is drone at a certain RPM. When you're cruising about that 3,000, 3,500 uh, RPM, you have that drone. This was designed in such a way to be able to cancel out that drone. So, at that particular RPM, the frequency that's been generated, the wave that's been generated is put in a position where it travels down this tube, reflects back, and has now 
a similar wavelength but opposing opportunity, opposing wave to what's coming out. And it cancels out and makes no sound. So you can actually have a loud exhaust. Literally, this thing is barely baffled. It has barely anything in it. But you have this nice, quiet tone, which is amazing. And the same thing can happen with pulse waves in terms of the gas itself. You can pulse it. You can have a certain RPM where you can have a scavenged beta. It's just amazing. So in essence, it's called a Helmholtz tube or resonator. You can read up on Helmholtz. Some OEMs use them, particularly on intakes, to get rid of intake roar. But I took it and used the technology and put it towards Porsches. And that being said, and I did, oh, I did with a Honda Fit too, and the Honda Civic, and the 964. I've done quite a few of them. The ones in the Honda Fit world, they didn't quite get it, so people liked it but didn't understand, like, oh, I don't get it. So, but the Porsche guys love it. It's just amazing, you know? Hey, BC, can you speak on long rod, mild stroke, drag engine benefits, all motor, says King Mars? Yes, I think you meant, um, Long rod, mid-stroke, drag engine benefits. Okay. I found a correlation years ago when I just did tons of experimentation around rod ratios and cylinder filling. And a cylinder filling could be accentuated by the cross-sectional area of the port. Now, what do I mean by that? That sounds like a lot of jargon, right? Let's take something as simple as a square motor. Okay, square motor, let's say, 85 bore, 85 stroke, okay? Opposed to under square, we have, um, you know, a smaller bore and a longer stroke like you see with D-series, 75 millimeter bore, 90 millimeter stroke, or an over square where you have a big bore like Porsche's, where you can have like a 100 millimeter bore and like a 85 stroke, okay? So, square motor, 85, 85. When the piston goes up to the top of the bore where combustion happens, you have that period of time where it just sits up there as the crank swings at the bottom of the arm, arm being the rod. That is called dwell. Now, if you want to make an engine super efficient, you want that dwell to stay there as long as it can. Because if you're at the combustion time frame, it sits there, allows for good combustion to happen, for it to happen evenly, and get ready to, for the piston to have work absorbed by combustion. If you're sweeping down and trying to get induction in place, as it does have that light dwell at the bottom, it gives enough time for the air to come in, in nice into the cylinder and fill up very nicely. So great for efficiency. A short stroke, on the other hand, I mean a short rod would, on the hand, not dwell as long. A long rod would dwell for a long period of time. So that being said, in performance applications, it's always nice to have a long rod, except there is something that is very interesting that's going on. What if you have a very, 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 very big car section area port and you want to begin that charge very quickly because it could be a bit lazy getting air inside that. That's where a long stroke and a relatively not so long rod can be an advantage. So you notice that when people do big strokes where it's 100 millimeter, 105, 110, 120, yeah, there's some guys doing 120K series. It's crazy, isn't it? They don't tend to get very, very uh, worried or concerned about raw stroke ratio because they feel like the stroke is good. But if you want to take full advantage of such a stroke with a short rod, have a good cross-sectional area. So net-net, if you have the capability of having an intake system, a, a head port system that can fill up the cylinder very nicely, by all means, why don't you go ahead and... Um, why don't you go ahead and... So why don't you go ahead and have a small port with a long rod and take full advantage of it. On the flip side, if you have an opportunity where you have a big cross-section airport, it's huge square ports and you just need to, don't be too concerned because a long rod may work against you despite the advantages of side loading. Now, if you have a mid-stroke, like I think that's what you mentioned earlier, you can take the best of both worlds. What I would do is get a head port that's really nice to prevent any friction losses from side loading, go as long as a rod you can stuff into there. Even if it means sometimes having a pin that goes into your oil rings and having some kind of border support or some kind of pin uh, bucket, or better yet, how do they say it, like a cap um, to allow you to like put a ring through it, or maybe you'll go to two rings alone, you will see gains. So big large stroke, don't get too concerned, especially cross section area. Short stroke, mid stroke, go as long as you can. Take advantage of that dwell, especially if your ports are not crazy. And then, above and beyond that, have the opportunity to 
get a good cylinder filling. So I hope that helps. First gen Honda Fit, would you boost the original L15A or swap the K series? Oh, by all means, there is no replacement for displacement, except for technology and EVs. But anyway, I digress. So yes, if I were your shoes and those are options, I would go with a K. So now, if you mean boosting the L15 or going at all motor K, still may go K. <laughs> Hello, CT Designs, long term no C. CT Designs has this beautiful S2000. He came here to get tuned recently and is now having a blast, you know? I'm planning on buying a Miata, says Lumpin. Ump. And he says, um, at 14 years old, oh, nice. Do you have anything that I should watch out for when buying those except for rust? Well, definitely, if you have the capability, I would do a proper leak down on that setup. Engine. On those cars, sometimes they're taken care of, many times they're abused, either because people just didn't want to maintain them or they're beating up on them and tracking them hard. I would do a proper leak down to check and see what's going on with that. Um, I'll look for fracture cracks around the suspension components or suspension pickup points. And I would check the coolant and the, under the oil cap for any kind of weird like colors, like if you have some kind of frothy or, or milky substance, especially on the oil cap. That means you have a blow hair gasket, which when people don't take care of them and beat them up, tend to experience that, you know? See, this says that he'll have a better blast when he gets that pump for the E85. I agree. So he came here tuned north of 400 horsepower, but has a lot more in it because he was fuel limited. So by all means, he can make that happen. By all means. That one-to-one -one combustion to EV swap seems interesting. It, it really is. Um, Dilling, for those of you who don't know him, he's across the pond in Belgium. He designed the turbo fans on this beautiful blue wagon sin right there. He also worked with us toward, with some turbo fans with some of our Hyundai projects. Very talented individual. He even reinforced my belief in the Fusion 360 software because he loves it as well and got me to look at some parameters I didn't even care to look at before. So he's been a very positive influence on me. So that being said, he's a good guy, all around good guy, great guy. And I wanted him to join me on the first EV project, but I think he was tied up with some of the projects. But guys at Brixham did a good job nonetheless. But the EV stuff has really changed my life. It really has. It's just the, the torque is amazing. Me being able to have a lot of fun without the guilt. And I've never had so much attention with, without making noise. It's just the most amazing thing ever. And then I'm talking to the guys at TurboSmart to um, get some pumps. They have these really nice pumps that we can use for cooling in terms of the uh, batteries and also the inverter and motor and all that fun stuff. Stuff. Stater, you know, which is good. Big two minutes. Do you have any more Genesis Coupe shirts? I just may. I'll, I'll check. DM me and I'll see. I just may have some largest and maybe extra largest left. Very few, which is good, you know. Can you explain the science behind placing socks over the intake filters? Won't that restrict flow? Says Texas Holyfield. So, great question. The socks, yes. <laughs> if you went to a regular kind of socks or what you would see for like a spill control on a Master cylinder, yes. But on the AEM Canon side, they have these dry flow protectors, and these kind of go over the filter element and have a negligible, if any, effect on filtration or on breathability. So if you do a lot of off roading, and in my case, I have turbos hanging out the back of the car, it's a bit of a challenge for me to be able to do something to keep rubbish and elements on, from getting on my pleats and it gets harder and harder to clean out. But with those pre-filters, my goodness, they do a good job. And I just make this habit of every time I change my oil, I take the pre-filters off and wash them, clean them with the AM solution, and then put them back on. And so weird, they're so dirty, but then my filter behind, my pleated filters is clean. So it's like an extra layer of protection, which is great, but also doesn't impede flow at all, which is nice. But if you've got regular socks, then it could be a challenge, you know? I wish we had some mad garages in England, says Matthew Craven. I think you do. You know, coming to the NEC every January was a mecca for me. Prior to CES, I used to go to the auto sports show. And it's almost like, dare I say, the UK is like the center of the universe when it comes to all things motorsports. There are some sick facilities out there. Sick facilities, you know? AM versus Canon filters, what's your top pick? I like both. I really do. Um, there are applications where Canon exists that AM doesn't have. You used to have a lot of truck stuff, but nowadays I don't think they have that many truck stuff, so I'll go with K&N. 
on all my Porsches, I use AM filters. I mean, I, I like both. They have very good technology. Both of them are really, really good. You can't go wrong with either one. But I tend to focus more on my, you know, Porsche and Sport Compact stuff with the AEM. And then for my crazy domestic stuff, I go with KNN, which is pretty interesting, you know? Have you driven the new Turbo J series Acura is coming out with? Not quite yet. So we do get access to pre-production vehicles from Honda because of our relationship with them, but I plan on doing something very soon, but not quite yet. How safe are EV swaps? Pinch, when done right, everything can be safe. And that's with anything. So I've had cars come here with leaking fuel systems, with um, exhaust systems right next to the gas tanks, um, with gas tanks that are, not, that are vented towards a heat source. So even on petrol cars, and you're sitting on this crazy tank of flammable fluid, it could be a danger. Same thing with EVs. If you don't shield things properly, if you don't protect yourself well, if you don't have fuses and contactors where they should be, if you don't have a battery management system to keep things in check, if you don't have thermistors in your batteries to make sure that things are in, in check and be able to derate either charging or discharging, there's so many things that if you don't pay attention or have the right equipment to handle such high voltages and currents, you can really get very hurt very easily. So that being said, um, it's, it's really just, it's just scary. You know, it's just really scary. Um, every type of propulsion system has its, its, its pros and cons in terms of safety. And it's within our responsibility to make sure we do what's right, you know? Which one do you prefer, Toyota Super or GTR? Now, we're talking current models, I assume so. If I'm looking at the Mark V versus the new GTR, I will go GTR, believe it or not. I really would, you know? Where is your car from fastest car? Um, asks Joshua. So Joshua, forgive me guys, I'm gonna kind of move something around here and forgive me for those of you on YouTube, but I'm gonna show him the car from fastest car. So it is right over there, right there. Forgive me guys. So, ah, that's where it is. The car from fastest car is right there. Chilling, <laughs> kicking back, having a good time, relaxing per se. So I hope that helps. Joshua nine six seven five. I wish I can grow up to be just like you. Actually, matter of fact, Jack Creasy, you can grow up to be better than myself, much better. Um, I didn't have a me when I grew up. I didn't have access to technology that you have today. I'm, I'm just now doing things with rapid prototyping and testing and computer systems and all these things that I didn't have even when I was in school. If I want to draw something, that would be so weird. AJ and I talked about it this weekend. We had to learn drafting. We had to draw everything by hand and pencil with a straight edge and on the drafting table. But nowadays, in the comfort of my office or I was in the back of the shop here, I can from scratch draw up something. Imagine something, draw it up in seconds, have it printing on my 3D printer and put it in the field. It was crazy, you know? So that being said, it's really a good thing. Um, what batteries are you use, using EVs? I'm, I'm really partial to the uh, LG Chem batteries. And what do you use for BMS? I use Orion 2, BMS 2, by Ewood Energy. And I love it, because it allows me to do wonderful things. It allows me to limit what my, what my motor could demand. It allows me to limit discharge. It allows me to limit charging, especially when I charge my batteries all the way up. I don't want to keep with regen pumping in current into it when I don't have to. I don't have to keep recharging it when it's full. It's full. So it limits what I can regen into it until the time comes for me to be able to charge it back up, keeping my battery safe. If I'm charging, whether I'm doing fast charging or, or level two charging or level one charging, if my battery temperatures get up, it can limit the amount of current going to the batteries to allow me to charge at limitation. It also, during charging, allows me to balance my cells. So if I have a cell that's really weak, it allows me to like, kind of bring them all up to spec so I can get the most use out of them. So it's really good. It's really good indeed. Elio is asking, do you have a mechanical engineering background? Believe it or not, I have a chemical engineering background. And even though I took a lot of electives in the mechanical engineering, I am a chemical engineer. And it's very good for me because it allowed me a very strong basis in different facets of engineering, which is absolutely fantastic. You're absolutely legend. Thank you for your advice. My pleasure indeed, Jack Creasy. I appreciate the kind words. Have you modified the engine, the Wankel? No, I have not. Um, even though we have a relationship with Mazda, I haven't had the honor of building a car for them. And I would love to build a petrol Mazda, maybe a you know, Skyactiv or something like that. And then also 
cherished the opportunity to build my very first Wanko because I love the simplicity of those motors. I love the lightweight. I don't mind the sound. It sounds pretty good for me, which is great, you know? Kenny's a strange, says the strange Emmy. We make fun of you, Emmy guys. <laughs> love your work, brother, says uh, Devilish KK from Pakistan. Thanks so much for joining, indeed. Good morning, Sleeper versus Flash. Good seeing you, indeed. Have you seen the Zinger 21C? Yes, I have. That thing is pretty freaking cool. Now, I haven't seen it firsthand, but I've seen a lot of photos online. It's a, I, I like how that car looks. We were just talking about that vehicle with our friends from Bricks and Forge a week and a half ago or so, you know? Is there a waitlist for tuning? Absolutely, there is. Um, and it's getting bananas. I'm getting to a point where I'm getting almost overwhelmed with projects. That one has to go to paint in, oh, tomorrow. This one has to definitely get worked on tomorrow as well. This one is behind schedule and needs to be brought up to speed. This one needs to be brought up to speed as well. I need to finish with that today. Um, I have this Audi R8 I'm waiting for EC on. That Civic has to be done. There's another drag Civic that has to be done by the weekend. It's, it's crazy. So that being said, a lot to do. And it takes me away from my own personal passion projects, but customers first. Do you think this supercapacitors would be the future of EV? Fast charge is the key? I don't know. Maybe not just supercapacitors, but batteries with um, not as rare earth metals inside of them. And, you know, right now we can do a, have a lot of fun. Oh, density, energy density. That is something that's going to improve on very nicely. Maybe also density with cells for panels, for solar panels, could help quite a bit as well. But right now with CCS, with Chatamo, we have access to some pretty good quick charging setups now. Even on my own K3V, I can fully charge in 43 minutes and get to 80% of charge completely depleted in 30 minutes, which is amazing, you know? One question, what is the best engine swap, a Honda EK3, B18, C2, or H22? Now, if you want aftermarket support and ease of installation, Definitely the B18C would be the way to go. But if you like the advantage of a bigger displacement setup, with also the grunt of an H22, coupled with the, oh my goodness, that's a different factor, H22s are very nice and kind of underrated. Um, I have a bone stock H23 over there that with a leak cylinder, literally, I'm telling you guys, one dead cylinder with some Turbinex turbochargers and, and, and controls from TurboSmart made 423. Eyes closed, stock motor. It's crazy, huh? So there's a lot of opportunity there. But speaking of opportunity, guys, I may just have to depart. Um, I appreciate you joining me on this 153rd episode of BCMO Tech Tuesday. Remember what we talked about today? I talked about the SoCal, Electrified SoCal Initiative with Blink Charging. And I gave the site for the Blink. And if you want to be able to get your landlord or your business place to get involved, DM me or go to blinkcharging.com backslash Electrified SoCal, all one word. Take advantage of the HQ charging discount on Amazon for the Blink Charging HQ. It is BC Moto, all one word, BC Moto 3-0 to get 30% off and still get an amazing credit. And the thing is beautiful. Above and beyond that, Pure is offering sponsorships for oil. So make sure that you hit them up here on Instagram and they will sponsor. Tell them BC sent you. They'd like to make me happy. So they can definitely take full advantage of that. But guys, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for this opportunity for me to be there for you. Technology continues to improve. Have a great afternoon. This should be up here on Instagram indefinitely. I'll have it on YouTube in about a week. And right after this, I'll also have it on your favorite podcasting platforms, whether it is Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, any of your, four, your very popular ones, just type in BC Moto and we will come up. All right, guys, have a great one. Have a blessed day. Take care, cheers, and stay safe. Bye-bye.